Doesn't work. Hello, everyone. Hi. Welcome to the 2015 James Lawson Awards Ceremony. I want to recognize all of you in the audience, uh, both here and online. We're live streaming this event, and thank you very much for being with us. For those watching online, uh, my name is Hardy Merriman, and I am president of the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict. The Lawson Award was established in 2011 to honor people in any of three lines of work. Uh, the first, it was designed to honor organizers or activists who are outstanding in their leadership, courage, and strategic use of nonviolent civil resistance. Second, it was designed to honor journalists whose work captures civil resistance movements and brings greater global attention to them. And third, it was envisioned to honor educators and scholars whose valuable work significantly advances people's understanding of civil resistance. This year, we honor an activist, organizer, and educator, Yad Bernat, <clears throat> for his years of nonviolent civil resistance in Palestine and for his educational efforts to show people around the world the power of this form of struggle. Leading nonviolent resistance since 2004, Yad Bernat is head of the Berlin Popular Committee against the Israeli Wall and Settlements, which campaigns against Israel's plan to replace the village of Berlin with Israeli settlements. As dominant narratives of Israel and Palestine have focused on the threat of violence on both sides, Iyad has exercised outstanding leadership in nonviolent resistance, achieved victories with his community, and remains steadfast in his commitment to nonviolent means, despite the fact that he, his family, and his friends are subject to life-threatening violence used against them because of their nonviolent actions. His courage, moral stand, and political wisdom in organizing effective civil resistance campaign are an example to everyone who seeks to wage and resolve conflicts without the use of violence. Yad embodies the vision behind the James Lawson Award, and we are honored to have him present with us today. We have three other <clears throat> distinguished speakers coming after me to introduce Iyad further and give some historical context about nonviolent resistance in Palestine. So what I will do here as the first speaker is to focus on what the James Lawson Award means by, take, by talking for several minutes about James Lawson's life and example. Now under normal circumstances I would not be doing this, as Jim Lawson himself would be here. But Jim is 86 years old, and he has a current health challenge that has made it impossible for him to be here. I, I spoke with him last week, and he told me that he really wanted to be with us today, and that he really wished he could meet Yad, and he hopes to at some other time. He also told me that he looks forward to being at the awards ceremony next year, which I think is Jim's way of saying that his health challenge is temporary. So let me introduce some facts about James Lawson's wife, uh, li life to give a sense of the person for whom the award is named and what the award means. Among his many roles, uh, Reverend James Lawson is and has been a leading thinker, strategist, and organizer in nonviolent struggles for social, political, and economic change for now more than five decades. It's these contributions of his with which I am most familiar, though to truly put his impact in perspective would take far more than the few minutes I have and would require the breadth of knowledge of a historian looking at developments from the mid 20th century onward. Suffice it to say, James Lawson is a man who has inspired and led people, defied injustice, and stood tall for the values of freedom, equality, and human rights. He has done these things with the kind of courage, perseverance, and intelligence that expand our understanding of what is possible for ourselves and our fellow human beings. To give a sense of his stature, 
Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. remarked that Jim Lawson was, and this is a quote, the leading theorist and strategist of nonviolence in the world. King also called Lawson, quote, the greatest teacher of nonviolence in America. Born in 1928 in Uniontown, Pennsylvania, Jim, as I've come to call him, came from a line of Methodist ministers, and he received his local preacher's license in the same year he graduated from high school in 1947. When he received a draft notice for the US war in Korea in 1951, Jim had the option, as a clergyman, of getting a deferment, of avoiding the draft because he was clergy. But he felt that asserting this privilege would be unfair. And thus, he simply followed his conscience and refused to serve in the Korean War. He served 13 months in prison instead. Shortly after his release in 1952, he embarked to Nagpur, India for a three-year post as a campus minister at, and, and teacher at Hislop College. This period of time enabled him to study Gandhi's nonviolent methods, philosophy, and political impact. Upon Jim's return in 1956, he soon met the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who encouraged Jim to begin organizing in the US South. King told Jim, quote, we don't have anyone like you, and urged him to start with the movement immediately. Jim became a student at Vanderbilt University and began investigating numerous issues in the city of Nashville, Tennessee, as the first step of developing a strategy that would crack open the status quo of racial segregation in that city. Using his own experience and intelligence, combined with the knowledge he had of Gandhi and other thinkers, Lawson trained and led students from four colleges and universities in one of the most remarkable campaigns of nonviolent civil resistance in US history, the Nashville lunch counter sit-ins, as it is commonly come to be called. Now, those of you sitting here saw a film about it uh, several days ago. But for those online, uh, there, this film is available for streaming. Uh, I do not have time to go into depth about the Nashville campaign and its display of transformative nonviolent power. But we are going to tweet a URL uh, with the hashtag Lawson Award or Civil Resistance uh, where people all over the world can stream the 30-minute video on the Nashville segment. In addition to the campaign in Nashville, Lawson's presence directly or indirectly impacted so many other campaigns in the civil rights movement that it's, it's, it's difficult to overestimate. The students that he had trained in Nashville became some of the most organized and disciplined in that movement. Some of them went on to co-found the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in 1960. In 1961, when the Freedom Rides were met with brutal repression from segregationists in the South, it was Jim Lawson and his Nashville students that helped ensure that the Freedom Rides continued uh, from Montgomery, Alabama to their end in Jackson, Mississippi, even in the face of clear and overt threats against them. Lawson worked on the March on Washington in 1963, the Meredith March in 1966, and on other campaigns in cities of Birmingham, Little Rock, and so many other places uh, that we don't have time to list them all. Later in the city of Memphis, Jim chaired the Committee for Workers in the Memphis Sanitation Workers' Strike of 1968. In 1974, Lawson left Memphis and became pastor of Holman Methodist Church in Los Angeles, where he served for 25 years until 1999. From the 1970s to the present, Lawson has continued to teach and train people in nonviolent struggle. He is very active and has involved himself in causes as diverse as immigrant rights in the United States, labor organizing, United States policy, policy in El Salvador and Central America, gay rights, reproductive rights, campaigns for economic justice and a living wage, and opposition to sanctions against Iraq before the war, and opposition to the Iraq war itself. Jim's knowledge and lived experience of fighting nonviolently for rights, freedom, and justice provides lessons to us all. His understanding of nonviolent struggle, an emphasis on strategy, organization, planning, and discipline, show us that waging civil resistance must engage both our heart and our head. In his commitment and tireless persistence over many decades, winning numerous successes along the way, is a reflection of the timeless wisdom I have heard so many times from seasoned activists over the years, but of which I constantly need to be reminded, and that wisdom is this. If you want to achieve something, commit yourself to it fully and do not give up. I am proud today to give the award in Jim's name to Iyad Bernat. Being with Bernat 
uh, for the last several days. Hearing him talk about five broken cameras uh, last night has been an honor and an education. Now, to provide background on civil resistance in Palestine and to further introduce Iyad, I would like to invite to the podium Dr. Mary Liz Elizabeth King, an organizer who learned from Reverend Lawson. Um, Mary's also one of our finest scholars on civil resistance in the world, has written books about both the civil rights movement and nonviolent resistance in Palestine. And lastly, Mary is a recipient of the 2011 James Lawson Award. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Hardy. Uh, the Reverend Dr. James Lawson was my first teacher of civil resistance when I was 22 years old and had just gone to work for the civil rights movement. So today I'm going with humility to build a bridge between Jim, as I call him, and the Israelis and Palestinians who have chosen nonviolent civil resistance in their quest for justice. The first thing I would point out is that I believe that Jim would say that to describe the Israeli-Palestinian strife as ancient animosities is a serious misrepresentation. Yet this is something we hear all the time from the international media. Historical Palestine was small from the start of history settled by different peoples, many different peoples. The name Palestine comes from the Philistines, one of many groups living there. Among the neighbors were the Hebrews, who were Jewish and monotheistic, believing in one God. The Jews ruled the inland hills of the rocky terrain of Palestine from the 10th century before the Common Era until the start of the Roman period. The diaspora of the Jews began in earnest in 586 before the Common Era. In other words, dispersal. Lured by opportunities, Jews emigrated from the rocky terrain of Palestine throughout the Mediterranean world and established large flourishing communities in Alexandria in Egypt, in Babylonia in what would become Iraq, in Asia Minor, which we call Turkey, and Syria. In each of these four areas, according to a historian who's the author of a 10-volume study of the history of the Jews, there were approximately one million Jews each, plus one million remaining in Palestine. He says that every 10th Roman was a Jew. By the seventh century of the Common Era, Palestine was experiencing rapid expansion of Islam as travelers from the Arabian Peninsula spread a new, also monotheistic faith. The peoples in Palestine, for the most part, adopted Arabic and the Islamic faith. In 1517, Palestine was incorporated into the Ottoman Empire, and for 400 years, its differing peoples were under the Turks until the British entered Jerusalem in 1917. And during most of this recent history, more than 80% of the inhabitants of Palestine were Sunni Muslims. Palestine's many minority communities lived alongside the majority without the sectarian conflict that we can see in Lebanon. The Christians, also monotheistic, represented about 10% as the Ottoman era ended. A small Jewish population remained in Palestine continuously, and its numbers would grow in the 18th and 19th century as Eastern European Jews came to return. 80% of Palestine's population were peasant farmers eking out a living in poor, arid conditions. In the 1880s, Jewish recolonization of Palestine began as barbaric pogroms drove millions of Eastern European Jews to seek new homes in Western Europe, North America, and Latin America, a small minority sought to return to Palestine. In the late 19th century, the political philosophy of Zionism began to develop coterminously at the same time as Marxism. 
Jews had become acculturated as a result of living throughout the world and had often made dramatic contributions to the cultures and literatures and music, particularly in Europe, and yet they were still regarded as foreigners. The concept of a nation state seemed fairly basic in an era of European colonialism. And it was a response for the discrimination and persecution the Jews were facing, according to the Zionists. The Zionist movement was secular and political, and for years opposed by religious establishments of Judaism. And in advocating a national home for the Jews, it considered various countries, where eventually the focus fell on Palestine. Only after World War I did average European Jews realize the ethical and practical complications of the Zionist dream, namely, half a million Muslim and Christian Arabs were long settled in Palestine. The newly arriving Jewish immigrants did not try to integrate into the institutions of Palestine. Their ideology for a Jewish homeland meant developing their own institutions and ventures, generally without Arab employees or consumption of Arab-produced goods. Jewish colonization had two basic doctrines. One was Hebrew land, land once sold or bought from a Palestinian Arab should never be returned to a Palestinian Arab. And the other basic doctrine was Hebrew land or conquest of land, con sorry, Hebrew labor, in which Arabs would not be employed. One Israeli historian puts it this way, the Arabs sought instinctively to retain the Arab and Muslim character of the region and to maintain their position as its rightful inhabitants. The Zionists sought radically to change the status quo, buy as much land as possible, settle it, and eventually turn an Arab-populated country into a Jewish homeland. Now, the Ottoman Empire was defeated in World War I, and the modern Palestinian national movement began, in a sense, in 1916 with the Sykes-Picot Agreement, which divided the Ottoman territories between the British and the French. It grew as British General Allenby militarily entered Palestine in December 1917 after the Turks evacuated and when the League of Nations granted the British mandate for Palestine in 1922. Britain at this time ignored its many promises to the Palestinian Arabs made in correspondence during 1914 to 1918 promises of independence in return for help in the war. Instead, Britain committed itself to a Jewish homeland. In November 1917, the British Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs, Lord Balfour, issued a letter supporting a Jewish national home to Lord Rothschild, London leader of the Rothschild banking family and British Jewry. His words, his Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of the existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine. Establishing a national home for world Jewry without prejudice to rights of existing non-Jewish communities, I believe Jim would say, was impossible. In 1947, depleted by World War II, Britain admitted that the situation in Palestine had become uncontrollable and announced its withdrawal, leaving the predicament to the infant United Nations. With strong pressure from the United States, which had long supported the Zionist movement, and as remorse swept the world, over the way that Western anti-Semitism had culminated in the Holocaust, the United Nations General Assembly voted for partition to take effect when Britain withdrew in May 1948. Jim would, I believe, note 
that the United Nations never condoned the expulsion of the Palestinian Arab population. In the proposed partition plan, Jews who were then 30% of the population were to be given 50% of the land of which they then owned 6%. Zionist leaders accepted the plan, though whether this was a long-term acceptance or not is ambiguous. Israel has since claimed that it began to fight for self-defense when Arab armies invaded after the British withdrawal in May 1948. In fact, displacement of Palestinian Arabs began in December 1947. And by the time the State of Israel was declared in May 1948, thousands of Palestinian Arabs had been forced to flee their homes. Now, a handful of Israeli historians has been working patiently for decades in archives. And they show that subsequent to the establishment of the State of Israel, 700,000 Palestinian refugees, half the Palestinian Arab population in 1948, were compulsorily displaced, expelled, or fled their homes and property. Jim would, I believe, have us recognize that far from being ancient, this conflict was created by Britain, the United States, and other players in the contemporary era. Great powers were the underwriters of the political and military structures within which the Palestinian Arabs have struggled and are struggling to preserve their heritage. After the 1948 war, the land was drenched in blood, a combination of Zionist terror groups, responding Arab militias. Meanwhile, ideologies are being promoted in the refugee camps created for Palestinians that war and armed struggle were the only thing that could bring any results. It's often said that the Palestinian leadership has always taken the most extreme violent stands. But I've looked into this matter with almost 18 years of research in original and archival documents, and my review does not substantiate that. What I have found is that neither the British nor the Zionists responded to the expression of Palestinian grievances when the Palestinian Arabs employed nonviolent strategies, thereby reinforcing violent alternatives. By the autumn of 1938, the historian J.C. Hurwitz had concluded, these events had taught the lesson that the use of violence as a political weapon produced results which appeared otherwise unobtainable. Jim would, I believe, remind us that the turbulence of the Palestinian people in response to the UN decision on partition has never subsided. Two techniques evolved for struggle, one nonviolent and one violent. In June 1967, Israel militarily conquered the remaining lands allocated by the United Nations for the Palestinians. And the West Bank and Gaza Strip came under military occupation. Arab East Jerusalem also came under Israeli authority. These changes have not been acknowledged by international law. I believe that Jim would have us understand that any use of violence consolidates and unifies the targeted group. It solidifies the unwillingness to yield to challengers. In 1969, the Palestine Communist Party broke the Israeli ban on political organizing and began organizing hundreds and thousands of small committees because it believed that this was the best preparation for independence. One authority told the New York Times that 45,000 women's committees, professional associations, student and faculty unions were in existence on the eve of the 1987 Intifada. These committees would act as the organizational base for the 1987 Intifada, which means shaking off. It's a linguistically nonviolent term. The committees were often run and led by women. The Israeli army insisted that the uprising was caused by outside agitators stirring up a passive population. And government spokesmen often called it war. I believe that Jim would judge that probably the main determinant 
in the outcome of the Intifada in 1987, that began in 1987, was the willingness and capability of Israel to interrupt and administer violence. And yet, we must also be clear that Israel never deployed tanks, as did the Chinese in Tiananmen Fair, uh, Square. In fact, nearly the entire Palestinian Arab people had unified itself under occupation in, for essentially three years using nonviolent means to seek to lift the occupation. This was not against the Israelis. This was against the military occupation that had been stalled in 1967. Of course, children discovered that if they threw stones, television cameras would come almost immediately. Now, member of the Knesset and sociologist Noemi Hazan has told me that 86 new Israeli groups came into existence in 1987 and 1988 to support the 1987 Palestinian Arabs. So Jim would point out that only nonviolent action makes it possible to create conditions in which Israeli citizens could once again, as in 1987, question and defy their government's policies. Plus, I believe he would say, the only form of struggle with potential in this context to work for justice is nonviolent civil resistance. You will shortly be hearing from Iyad Bernat, who is devoted to this thesis. Jim always asks that we also look at underlying moral issues. The basis for the Zionist claim was the Balfour Declaration, a promise made by Imperial Britain, which had no constitutional rights in Palestine. It was given status by the mostly Western United Nations, which admitted a new state to the international community on conditions that are yet to be fulfilled. I believe that Jim would note that the calamity befalling one people does not give rights to negate another people. By the same moral argument, he would point out that the Palestinians cannot now ask for a solution that would return the status quo ante at the turn of the 20th century and displace the Israelis. A moral issue is at the heart of the Palestinian question. It is unethical to do away with the people. The Zionists regarded the Palestinians as primitive and insignificant. Indeed, the moral bases for human relations provide the ground on which I and you deplore and condemn the Holocaust. Finally, I have heard Jim pose a question. I have heard him ask, can we, using our Judaic Christian Islamic foundations fight for justice. Can we? We will soon honor in Jim's name one person who is doing that. But I will now turn the microphone over to my colleague, Professor Stephen Zunas, who is at the University of San Francisco and co-chairs the guiding committee of the academic advisors to the International Center for Nonviolent Conflict with Professor Eric Chenoweth. And I will just simply say that Stephen is the most prolific of this 200 or so scholars that I consider my kinfolk in civil resistance studies. And I'm so glad that he's here now to say more. At a time when much of the media in the West is trying to depict Muslims and Arabs as somehow predisposed to violence, the recipient of this year's James Lawson Award serves as a reminder of the centuries-old tradition of nonviolent resistance in the Arab Islamic world. For years, we have heard people here in the United States and elsewhere asking, where is the Palestinian Gandhi? by which they mean a respected indigenous leader who rejects armed struggle in favor of sustained nonviolent resistance. In reality, of course, there have been hundreds of such Palestinian Gandhis 
going back for decades. Perhaps the single most significant one of these nonviolent activists today is Iyad Brunat. He was imprisoned for two years as a teenager for his anti-occupation activism, suffering regular beatings and horrific prison conditions. Despite this, he has remained committed to resistance and to nonviolence. He has, for the past decade, headed the Berlin Popular Committee, the movement in his village that was organized when Israeli occupation forces began constructing a barrier on village land separating the people from their olive orchards, grazing lands, and other means of livelihood. For more than a decade, Yad Bernat has led his fellow villagers, often supported by sympathetic Israelis and other international activists, engaging in weekly Friday demonstrations against the separation barrier, nicknamed the Apartheid Wall, and the illegal confiscation of his village land by Israeli occupation forces and colonists. He has been repeatedly arrested. His home has been frequently raided and ransacked. He has witnessed his 16-year-old son shot and permanently disabled, seen friends killed, and seen his village's centuries-old olive trees burned, and has suffered the daily humiliation of foreign military occupation. Those of you who have seen his brother's award-winning documentary, Five Broken Cameras, have seen how <clears throat> repression is so severe, so constant, so in your face, Yad Bernat's commitment to nonviolence <clears throat> is all the more remarkable. Legally speaking, as long as they don't attack civilians, those living under foreign belligerent occupation, like the Palestinians in the West Bank, have the right to armed resistance. Yad Bernat recognizes this. When you are in such a critical struggle, however, one for the very survival of your community, what matters is what works. He recognizes that armed struggle would only reinforce the Israeli narratives that they are simply victims of terrorism, would be used to justify even greater repression, more killings, and more land confiscations. That would mean, and it would mean the loss of the sympathy and support his struggle has gained around the world. Yad has not only been a great leader locally, he has made his cause an international one, welcoming supporters from around the world to join him and his fellow villagers in their resistance, including Jews from Israel, the United States, and elsewhere. He has welcomed those regardless of religion or nationality, regardless of whether they support a two-state solution or a single binational state. He has welcomed anyone who is willing to engage in nonviolent struggle against the occupation and illegal settlements. The resistance to the apartheid wall has extended beyond Berlin to more than two dozen other towns, but it has been Iyad's innovative and creative tactical and strategic leadership, including the savvy use of media, which has put his village on the map. In 2004, the International Court of Justice ruled unanimously, with the exception of the U.S. judge who descended on technicality, that while Israel could build a security wall or fence along its internationally recognized borders, they could not build it through Palestinian villages and orchards and other lands in what is universally recognized as occupied territory. In response, the Bush administration and leading members of Congress in, attacked the world court. Among those leading this assault against international law were Senators John Kerry, Joe Biden, and Hillary Clinton, all three of whom would later become major players in the Obama administration. They co-sponsored a Senate resolution supporting the construction of the barrier on Israeli terms, condemning the decision of the World Court and claiming, despite evidence by Amnesty International and other human rights groups to the contrary, that the Israeli government had taken into account the need to minimize the confiscation of Palestinian land and the imposition of hardship on the Palestinian people. So Iyad and his compatriots have not just been challenging the policy of the Israeli government, they have had to challenge the policies of the world's one remaining superpower as well. Despite these obstacles, they have won some important victories. In two, a 2007 ruling by the Israeli Supreme Court in response to the protest ordered the wall moved 500 meters further east, thereby returning over half the confiscated land to his village. Biden, Kerry, and Clinton have moderated their views somewhat and have become more critical of Israeli settlements and land grabs than they were 10 years earlier when the Berlin struggle began. Indeed, Iyad's outstanding leadership and nonviolent discipline has enabled millions of Americans to become familiar with their struggle, 
and has played a role in shifting U.S. public opinion towards a more balanced perspective on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. As someone who has worked in support of Palestinian rights since he was a teenager, which is over 40 years, <laughs> the very idea that a documentary film so sympathetic to the Palestinian struggle would be a nominee for the Academy Award <laughs> just boggles my mind. And the fact that it was is a testament, not just to the quality of the film, but the quality of the Berlin resistance and its leadership that has made it such a compelling story. So this award honors an ordinary man, born a peasant in an agricultural village in an occupied country, who nevertheless has gone on to do remarkably extraordinary things. This recognition challenges both the extremists within Hamas who advocate violence and terror against the occupation, as well as extremists within the Israeli and American, and American governments who support the violence and terror of the occupation. This year's James Lawson Award recognizes a man who, like the award's namesake, recognizes just how powerful strategic nonviolent action can be against extraordinary odds through wise, creative, and courageous leadership. I'd now like to um, present my colleague on ICNC's Academic Advisory Committee, Anna Marie Codor. She is a performing artist, scholar, and activist. Uh, following her getting her PhD from Sciences Po in Paris, she became a postdoc at Harvard, where, uh, along with young scholars and leaders in the Middle East and North Africa, co founded a, a project which has done high level academic trainings for hundreds of um, civil society leaders. and and um, educators from throughout the Middle East and North Africa. And in short, she's someone who understands the power of um, knowledge and action in transforming society, the perfect person to do the uh, final introduction um, for the James Austin Award. Thank you, Stephen. It's a great joy and an honor for me to introduce my friend, Iyad Bernat. The first time I met Iyad was in August of 2009. I was in Ramallah to meet with Palestinian activists and journalists and academics for a workshop that would be organized the following year by the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict. Kind of a short version of FSI focusing on the specific challenges of the nonviolent popular resistance in Palestine. I had been visiting several of the villages that were leading the struggle against the occupation and of course, I had spent time in Berlin. But at that time, Iyad was not there. Iyad was not to be found anywhere. He was in hiding. It took me days before being able to reach him. Nobody ever gave me any cell phone number for him. It was through a friend of his that I finally was able to meet with him in the dark back room of a tiny coffee shop in Ramallah. I was waiting there with his friend, not knowing if Iyad would eventually show up. And suddenly, there he was, with his large smile and his deep, piercing eyes welcoming me to Palestine. You feel the warmth and the charisma of this man instantly, an incredible intensity of presence. And then we start talking. And this man who is researched by the Israeli Shin Bet, this man who has been arrested so many times and beaten up and detained and tortured, this man talks to me, opens his heart with so much compassion and really listens and he really cares. And all he wants to know is how he can help me because all he wants is to make sure this workshop is gonna be a big success, which it was. And he spends all hour with me when I only expected him to stay for a few minutes. After all, he's on the run and it might be dangerous for him to stay that long. Indeed, he never stays very long in any single location. He sleeps every night in a different place. He hasn't seen his family in weeks. But despite of all that, he takes all this time to explain to me that in details what it is like to be a resistant to the Israeli occupation, what it is like to organize a movement while being in hiding and constantly moving from one place to the next, what it is like to strategize and coordinate actions in such circumstances. And what I discover then is what an incredibly creative leader Iyad is. One thing that matters most to him 
is the visibility of the movement in the eyes of the rest of the world. The Palestinian struggle, which has been going on for so many decades, needs to be able to sustain the attention of the world and to attract more and more supporters in Europe, in the United States, and elsewhere so that they can pressure their governments and so they can develop campaigns of boycott, divestment, and sanctions. In order to achieve this, Iyad and the other leaders of the Popular Committee want to make Bilhin a place of incredibly creative resistance, a place that will attract activists from around the world who will be able to say, I was there. And how to make this happen? Here is how. You remember the Hollywood blockbuster Avatar, a sci-fi movie telling the story of an indigenous people on a faraway planet being colonized by humans and dispossessed of their land and resources. When the film was released, immediately the Berlin Committee decided <clears throat> to use the plot of Avatar as an illustration of the Palestinian struggle. Activists painted themselves in blue and dressed like the characters of the film to protest against the wall and against the dispossession of their own land. And their YouTube video went viral that week. There is a reason why Bilhin has become one of the most attractive spots for international activists to come participate into the Palestinian struggle. It is because despite the, the risks and the threats, there's always something new and unexpected, something totally cool and surprising happening in Bilhin. And I have seen how important Iyad is to this. In addition to his commitment and persistence, he has a great creative mind that is constantly inventing and proposing new ideas. And in that first hour of our first encounter, I could fully grasp how masterfully Iyad and the other leaders of the Popular Committee in Bilhin have been able to make Bilhin such a symbol, a place that embodies all of Palestinian resistance and how they have been able to put this tiny village on the global map among the greatest places of resistance in the world and over the ages. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, the winner of the 2015 James Lawson Award for achievement in the practice of nonviolent conflict, Mr. Iyad Bernat. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Emery. Assalamu uh, alaikum. Excuse me first, I want to send a warm regards to my wife that she stand with me side by side in this hard way. To my children, to my friends in the popular committee against the occupation. Ladies and gentlemen of the International Center of Nonviolent Conflict and participating, greeting to you all. First of all, I would like to thank you for selecting me for this important award. This recognition gives us hope and strength to continue our resistance with the goal of justice and freedom for Palestine. I am here to talk to you, but in doing so, I have left my people in Palestine. I have left my people in pain to be with you today not to talk about Iyad Burnout, but to talk about the people of Palestine, a people of Belayin, the Palestinian who's inside and outside our home. For me, it is possible 
to be with you today yet that doesn't separate me from our struggle against the occupation. For us Palestinians, our everyday lives, our mere existences is a form of a struggle against the occupation. It has been this way for 67 years. The people of Palestine are facing violence every day from the soldiers of the Israeli occupation army, day after day, minute after minute. Every day in Belayin, we are subjected to the thefts of our land, the raiding of our houses in the night, and the destruction of our beautiful olive trees. Just like the occupation army seeks to do to us Palestinians. This is the case not only in Belayin, in all Palestine. In Belayin, we resist every day and we have demonstrations peacefully against the occupation every Friday for the past 10 years. We Palestinians standing alongside Israeli and international activists. We resist physically with our bodies, not with violence. By tying ourselves in our olive trees, by putting ourselves in caves, in barrens, in cylinders. In order to resist the goal of the Zionist to rip us from our land and clear the way for a Jewish state free of all Palestinians. Our methods of nonviolent, of course, are met with great violence by our occupier against us. Their language is one of weapons and violence. They use many weapons against us, most of which are illegal by the international law. Two of our friends being killed during this demonstration. The first was Basim Abu Rahman, 17 of April 2009 had been shot by tear gas canister direct to his chest, and he's died in the place. The second was his sister, Jawahar Abu Rahma, 1st of January 2011. Many of our children and our people have been shot and injured during these demonstrations, and many of them suffer from disabilities inflicted by these weapons. One of these victims is my son, shot in the leg by a life bullet at only 16 years old. He lost his foot as a result. More than 150 people who's been jailed, most of them as children, that's been putting in jail between four to 18 months in this horrible situation. The use of violence against us is intended to break us because they know that our way of nonviolent resistance has affected the occupation and show the true face of the occupation to the world because our way relieves them for what they are. They do not want our methods to spread but despite their use of violence. We have succeeded to continue our resistance and spreading it to other places in Palestine that now resist through weekly demonstrations. More than 15 places now in Palestine that are doing the weekly demonstrations by nonviolent way, like Nalin, Nabsaleh, Al Walaja, Kufur Kadum, all these places after our succeed in Belay. We have also material succeed on the ground. We have succeed in demolishing part of the wall and moving it back 500 meters in my hometown. And it's the first time happened in Palestine 
that the Israeli government take a decision to demolish part of the wall and move it back 500 meters. It means we have 1,200 dunums back to the farmers that they can use it. We succeed to stop 2,000 apartments in the settlement Mitityahu Mizrah that's been built on our land. We succeed to send the message to many people in the world that this is not a security wall, what they said. This is just to confiscate more land, to build more settlements, to put the Palestinians in jails together, to make the life hard for the Palestinians. And we succeed. We have made it clear. Ladies and gentlemen, let it be said that we are not against the Jewish people. We are against the occupation. And we are fighting for our freedom, for justice and equality. We are fighting for a better future for our children and all children. Because the world, the world is a better place without the occupation. The world is a better place with free Palestine. The world is a better place with the violence against the women and men and children. For this struggle, I dedicate this word to my people in Belain, who have been steadfast for 10 years and continue to this day. To the Palestinian people, both those inside and those outside, to whom we promise we will never forget your right to return home. To all Palestinian prisoners held unjustly in the occupier jails, and to all international and Israeli activists who join us in our efforts. Again, thank you all, and I hope that this award gives us greater opportunity to work together for justice and peace. Free Palestine.